brilliant, innovative figures as Albert Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, and Steve Jobs. And now to this list, he's added Jennifer Doud Doudna. Uh, she may not yet have quite the same name recognition as the others, but as Walter makes clear, her Nobel Prize winning work on gene editing ranks among the most significant biological inventions ever. By developing the gene editing technology known as CRISPR, Jennifer Doudna dramatically expanded the role science can now play in reshaping the nature of life itself. Walter, as usual, tells this story vividly, comprehensively, and insightfully, recounting not just the path-breaking science involved, but also examining the moral quandaries raised by the revolutionary ability to revise our genetic structure. As Publishers Weekly said in a review of the book, the Codebreaker succeeds in depicting science at its most exhilarating. As an added treat this afternoon, as I mentioned a moment ago, Walter will be joined in conversation by Jane Powley, whose prominence in broadcast journalism has spanned nearly five decades, beginning with NBC and continuing more recently with her role as host of CBS Sunday Morning. She's also the author of two best-selling books, her memoir, Skywriting, and Your Life Calling about people reinventing themselves later in life. For those of you not familiar with this virtual format, uh, although you're not visible to us, you'll still be able to ask a question if you'd like. To do so, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. The chat function also will be active, and in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing additional copies of the Code Breaker. So Walter and Jane, take it away. Thank, Thank you Brad. very much, Brad. Hi, Walter. Um, hey, Jay. <laughs> it's kind of a thrill and, and a, a terrifying one, a thrill like, like the roller coasters I try to avoid at, uh, at the fairgrounds. Why am I here, Jane Pauley, an ambassador from the 20th century, uh, to conduct a conversation with someone who dwells entirely in the future, such as Walter Isaacson. It is an honor for me uh, to be with you. Uh, I'd like to say hello to the participants who I presume uh, are here because uh, they know a little bit about Walter Isaacson and his previous books and have great expectations about the code breaker. I, I would like to start, if I may, uh, as I typically would in the 20th century. <laughs> When you were uh, in college, you were an editor at the Harvard Crimson. Uh, the significance of that is that the role of the editor is to make others shine. Whether it's the reporter or the subject of a story, the editor stands behind the limelight. And then fast forward into the Aspen Institute where uh, you are the impresario behind the scenes, delighting in great minds. There is something about your personality that allows your, your, your curiosity, absent ego, to just uh, wander at will. I want to know more about, about that, your ability to be behind the scenes, delighting in great minds, and what kind of great minds attract your curiosity the most? Well, thank you, Jane. And before we get a lawsuit from the Harvard Crimson, I was actually on the Lampoon, uh, which I hope added a dollop of humor to what I do. But I think you're right. I've been curious about a whole lot of things, but I realize that I'm not in the arena. Uh, the people I write about, whether it's Steve Jobs or Jennifer Doudna or Ben Franklin, those are the people who have really thrown themselves into the arena. So I try to get out of the way of people like them whose curiosity in some ways matches my own. I mean, one of the places I spent most of my career as you, you know, as a journalist uh, was at Time Magazine. And for a while I was a floater, which meant you floated from section to section. You do music one week, medicine the next week, you do foreign affairs and then business. And I became interested in a lot of things. And so the people I write about, and you know, you, you had it too, whether it's the Today Show or CBS Sunday Morning, we got paid. I mean, this is like weird. We got paid 
to be curious about everything and to learn about everything and to meet people who were curious about everything. It's, it was like a glorious uh, trade craft that we got to be into. And so whether it was Ben Franklin or Leonardo da Vinci who wanted to know everything you could possibly know about everything that was knowable, or a Steve Jobs or an Einstein or a Jennifer Doudna who connect the sciences with the humanities, who connect technology with the arts. Those are the type of people who've always fascinated me. Well, we are uh, fortunate that you are fascinated and yet not intimidated uh, to uh, be to dive into uh, heavy going information and master it sufficiently to put a book out with your name on it and get it right. Uh, that uh, confidence absent uh, ego, if I might observe, uh, is, is really precious, unique, and an explanation for your career as, as an author, I think, and well, your entire career. Can you tell me about your, your sense of, of ego and your sense of fearlessness to dive into these topics? You know, I don't think it's fearless. I think it's curiosity in the sense that, you know, Sal Khan, the guy who started Khan Academy from down here in New Orleans, um, he said, you can learn anything. And yeah, we're never going to be Einstein. We're never going to be Jennifer Dowden when it comes to genetics. But, you know, most people we know would think you were Philistines if you said, oh, I can never understand the difference between Shakespeare, you know, and and, you know, uh, somebody else, Tom Stoppard or whatever. But if you said, I don't understand science, people would shrug and laugh and say, no, I don't understand science either. Well, science is really beautiful. So is technology. So is what Steve Jobs did in digital technology. So I just like to say, all right, I'm curious. Please explain it to me. And sometimes, especially when it comes to science and technology, we get intimidated. We get fearful of it. And partly it's because scientists and technologists sometimes are a priesthood and they don't sort of welcome people in that much. I guess one of the things I can do is I can just go hang out with somebody like a Steve Jobs or a Jennifer Doudna or even read about Einstein and try to demystify it a bit so that all of us can feel, whoa, you know, nature's kind of amazing and science is kind of beautiful. And I, I, I hope, I hope I try to make it accessible. I think curiosity, if, if I could have gene editing, I would I'd happily accept cur curiosity uh, when instead I got a double dose of, of fearfulness and anxiety, uh, which I probably bring somewhat uh, to the subject of CRISPR and the uh, life sciences revolution that, uh, that you are perhaps more excited about. <laughs> <laughs> than this un unknown. Uh, let's talk about um, the code breaker. Uh, the code breaker is um, uh, Jennifer Doudna, uh, but it's the name of your, your book. And may I confess to being impressed and possibly a little surprised, uh, Amazon's number three bestseller, that's a lot of books currently, um, about a scientific acronym that uh, most of your readers uh, probably wouldn't get right on a test after they closed to the last page of the book, and about a scientist whose name gets mispronounced even by people who, who know who she is. Um, uh, so uh, uh, you know, kudos to you participants because you are the readers who are, are, are diving into uh, the, the code breaker. Um, what do you think is sparking this particular interest in this brand new, uh, for most of us, uh, technology uh, that uh, has to be explained by metaphors like scissors and, uh, and, uh, and pictures of viruses with a little sprung coming out you know, the top? What, what is capturing our curiosity in it? What do you think? Well, this is the most important technology of our time. You know, this, uh, you know, we were talking earlier in the book, and you mentioned that Mark Zuckerberg and Fong Zhang, who is one of the leaders of this technology, were at college together. And everybody thinks Mark Zuckerberg will be the more famous and important person of that class. 
No, it'll be people like Fong Jang and Jennifer Doudna, because as important as a Facebook is, this ability to edit our own genes, to decide that we're going to fight all these horrible diseases we may have, and with a little bit more trepidation that we'll be able to design our children to be healthier or have certain traits that we want, that's going to be the issue that we have as a society to discuss over the next 10 or 20 years. And it's not all that complicated. It involves a technology bacteria have been using for a billion years. It just really is a scissors. It's a scissors that's guided, that says, cut the DNA right here. And so when the coronavirus pandemic hit and we started using RNA, not only as a guide, but as a messenger to say, build these proteins, so I'll have an immunity to coronavirus. I think all of us realize wow, there's something really joyful about understanding the way something works, especially when that something is ourselves. The, the, the greats in, in any field are, uh, to uh, borrow from uh, Stephen, Steve Jobs, are people who think different. Yeah. Uh, just like um, uh, uh, Feng Zhang uh, was in biology, uh, when uh, the cool kids were uh, digital, uh, just as uh, Jennifer Doudna uh, went RNA when, when the whole world was into DNA. Mm -hmm. Why did she make uh, the choice to go take that off ramp when everybody was heading uh, full speed toward, uh, you know, in the other direction. When she was growing up in Hawaii, she told me she loved playing soccer, but she always played the positions others didn't play. And she watched, especially as boys played, they'd all run to the ball and she'd try to see the whole field and know what position would be better to play. I also think that gender does play into that a bit because when she was in sixth grade, she reads the double helix, James Watson's book about the discovery of the structure of DNA. And she notices a character in that book, Rosalind Franklin, who's very important, but treated in a condescending way. And she says to herself, wow, so women can become scientists. And her school guidance counselor says, no, no, women don't become scientists. And she persisted. And what she does is that she realizes that DNA is pretty interesting. But the more interesting thing is uh, the other sibling, which is RNA. And so in the 1990s, when all the alpha males are running to the soccer ball, which is sequencing DNA for the Human Genome Project. All these famous people you know were doing it, from Eric Lander to Francis Collins to uh, Craig Venter and whatever. There weren't a lot of women involved, but Jennifer Doudna, as well as some other women like Jillian Banfield, and then Jennifer's research partner, Emmanuel Charpentier, with whom she wins the Nobel Prize, they focus on RNA. And what RNA does is actually real work. I mean, DNA just sits in the nucleus of our cell curating our genetic material. But RNA goes in there, takes a snippet of something like a gene, and then goes and builds a protein using that blueprint in the manufacturing region of our cell. Or if we need to fix something, the RNA can guide a scissors, you know, an enzyme to cut and paste and fix. So this fact that RNA does all this work and what really cool was really exciting for her is she likes the big pictures. And when she and her uh, advisor discover that RNA can replicate itself, she realizes this is how life began on this planet. Not with DNA, not with proteins, but with RNA. So you're right, she kind of wanted to think different. Uh, and I think by doing so, uh, she's able to look around the corners, see what's coming next. And look, in this past year, when we were fighting the coronavirus and RNA virus, and we're using messenger RNA to make vaccines, I think we're all realizing that uh, the co-star of my book, besides Jennifer and um, uh, uh, Manuel Charpentier, is this molecule RNA which don't be intimidated by it. It's a real simple molecule, only got four letters, but you can code those letters to do what you want. Well, you can, and, uh, and, and I trust you. Um, 
Jennifer Doudna did not discover CRISPR. Um, she did not invent CRISPR. She discovers how CRISPR does what it does and has the insight that, well, that could be done in a, other cells. Oh, why am I talking? You explain what she discovered as opposed to what was already known. Well, that's exactly right. CRISPR has been around for a billion years. It's the way bacteria fight off viruses. And what bacteria do is every time a virus hits them, they take a mugshot tiny bit of the genetic material of the virus that attacked them. And they put them in these, the bacteria put them in their own DNA sequences in these clustered repeated sequences known as CRISPRs. And so if the virus attacks again, boom, uh, the bacteria gets to use an enzyme and chop it up. This is kind of a useful thing we could use now uh, when we're being attacked by wave after wave of virus. And so many people uh, started working on this about 20 years ago. But what Jennifer Dowden and Emmanuel Charpentier discover is exactly what are the components. And there are really only two of them, a single guide of RNA and then this enzyme that acts as a scissors. And they were able to engineer it so that you could reprogram the guide and cut at any spot of DNA you wanted to. And that was an aha moment. They said, wow, you could do that to edit genes in human beings. And then the book goes off into a race they have with other scientists, including Fong Zhang, who we mentioned, and George Church and many others, to prove how it works in humans. Um, it, 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 this is very complicated material for at least one of uh, uh, the people participating today, and that would be me. I, I found uh, a way into understanding uh, CRISPR uh, through uh, the uh, characters who are featured in your book and, and will have come up in conversations that some of the participants may have read with you in, in your promotion of the Codebreaker as uh, in the list of people uh, who are associated with the discovery of CRISPR and all and the revolution that well, will come, the yogurt makers. <laughs> I can relate to yogurt. It's in my refrigerator. I understand about yogurt and bacteria. The story of the yogurt break, it, the yogurt company, Danish, mm -hmm. and the two French food scientists working, among other places, in a laboratory in Wisconsin, uh, Tell me their role and why they would, of course, know so much about bacteria and bacteria's mortal enemy, the virus. Well, you got it right. You shouldn't <laughs> be saying that you don't understand this because this is the biggest war this planet has ever had is the war between bacteria and the viruses that attack them. And if you're a yogurt company, that's a big deal. Because what are you doing if you're making cheese and yogurt? You have a starter culture made of bacteria. What's your biggest threat? The viruses that mess up your yogurt or cheese or whatever. And it's also an interesting story because I like to celebrate in this book basic curiosity, basic science. People who are just driven to do things, not because they have practical uses, but because they want to understand nature. That's important. But it's also important to figure out some practical uses. So right when people are starting to study CRISPR, the system bacteria have for fighting off these bad viruses, the yogurt makers come in. Uh, Philip Barangu, uh, Philip Horvath, Rodolf Barangu, they both work for Danisco, they're friends. And the cool thing about Danisco is they keep track. Year after year, for 20 years, they have all of the sequences of the bacteria that they've used in their yogurt cultures. And so these two scientists working there, working with other people, including Jennifer Dowden and her crowd are looking at CRISPR, say, well, let's look at what happens. And they discover that every time one of the waves of, of viruses hit and destroy some of the bacteria making yogurt, by the next year when they sequence the DNA, these clustered repeated sequences 
have a mugshot of that virus. They have a tiny little snippet of that virus's genetic code in these CRISPR, in the uh, bacteria. And that's where you really prove the theory that the reason CRISPR exists in bacteria is because every time they have to fight off waves of viruses, they put these mug shots in and then use them to kill the viruses the next time. So this practical application, I mean, the yogurt culture and cheese culture industry using bacteria is billions of dollars a year. So this helped fund research into CRISPR. And I like the fact that pure curiosity and commercial advantage are working hand in hand to advance science. And they, they anticipated the potential of what they had proven in their discovery of the, of, of the, the mug shots, as, as you will. They, they knew it was bigger than just the yogurt industry. And yeah. in fact, apply for a patent. And why don't they have the Nobel Prize? You know, they have won some of the prizes and, you know, they, they surely were probably considered, uh, but. Oh, seriously? It, oh, yeah. No, Rodolf Barangu, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, Philippe Horvath and Rodolf Barangu have won a couple of the big prizes, along with Jennifer Doudna and many others. There's a whole team of people that include George Church, Fong Zhang, Barangu and Horvath of the yogurt company. Uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dowd. Now, they're all colorful characters in my book, and they keep going to prize ceremonies where they're sort of a mix and match of who gets the prizes. In terms of the Nobel, which Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier won, is the first two women pair to alone win a Nobel Prize in chemistry, is if you make a discovery, it's not enough to just say, and I think it'll work this way or whatever. You actually have to show exactly how it works. That's how you can get a patent. That's how you can get a Nobel Prize. And what they did was they did it in a test tube to say, with just these two or three ingredients, we can make this work and reprogram it so it can work differently. So I do think that creativity is a collaborative endeavor. And the march of CRISPR was a team sport. And all these people contribute to it. And that's, if I may say, one of the downsides of my book. If I had to criticize my book, I'd say, I took Jennifer Doudna because her life story is so interesting as a central character. But I wanted to make sure everybody else is in this picture too. And perhaps a better book would have been giving everybody equal billing, all 12 or so people who really were at the forefront of this. But that's not how you tell a story, and you are a storyteller. Yeah, well, we like narratives. You know, I grew up here, and one of my mentors, Walker Percy, said that two types of people come out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. He said, for goodness <laughs> sake, be a storyteller. And he told me, the way the Bible does it, it starts with Adam and Eve. Tell it through the lives of people. So that's why I became a biographer, is I do believe narrative storytelling with lessons and moral arcs are best done to the tales of real people you can relate to. You know, you are, as we've discussed, a, a person of uncommon curiosity. You are a learner. You are fearless. Um, uh, we share more. I think I am a, a I, I want tested so high in futuristic. I take those tests. I mean, probably some magazine, but so high in futuristic, it was a little scary. Um, uh, I do like to keep an eye on the, the, the future. Uh, I, I wrote a book, a, a modest doesn't just do justice to how modest it was. <laughs> little book it was about, it was a great about book. The, 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 the future um, and, and touted uh, with great excitement, uh, the future. Um, uh, when the fact is, I think I'm fearful of your future. The future you are describing, and there's no going back. This genie uh, is out of the bottle. And if it hadn't been Jennifer Doudna, a host of other scientists would have ultimately across the finish line and won the Nobel Prize. It was going to, the code was going to be cracked. 
Uh, so it's out of the bottle. And I'm not sure how comfortable I am with the world with this, uh, the, 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 the secret of, of, uh, of, of, of code breaking and the human genome. Uh, and I believe you too had some doubts that you have overcome. Well, I've had some doubts and so did Jennifer Doudna and through really the, you know, a middle part of the book, we go sort of hand in hand as we try to figure out when would you use this technology. I think this technology is wonderful in many ways. There's a woman named Victoria Gray who has suffered from sickle cell anemia. She last year became the first person to be cured of sickle cell because of CRISPR. We're curing blindness, we're curing cancer. We're allowing immunotherapy to fight cancer better. Uh, we're able to fight off, we'll be able to fight off things like cystic fibrosis and Huntington's. So one thing that turned Jennifer Dowden around and has turned me around is in discussing this sometimes, people say, oh, I don't know that we should fiddle with our genes, even though, you know, we certainly do a lot of things, including vaccinate ourselves in order to protect ourselves against mother nature. But even yesterday when I was in a discussion and everybody saying, in this bad, very shyly, a few people kept raising their hands or saying things in the chat room, like my granddaughter has a congenital condition and she's 12 and she'll be blind in two years. Or I have a grandson who's got this muscular you know, uh, problem that's just a pure, simple genetic thing. Will you be able to save him? He was saying to Jennifer Dowd. So I do think that we have to realize that every species on this planet uses all of its wiles and all of its tricks to try to lead healthier lives and thrive. So I'm very much in favor of this. And the coronavirus crisis made me feel, yes, we have to fight off viruses just like bacteria do. And that sometimes includes uh, doing gene editing when we have genetic deficiencies in it. I draw two lines. One is I'm perfectly comfortable with this technology if it's to correct a deficiency, some genetic problem in a patient in which a patient is gonna lead a very difficult or perhaps early death. And yeah, we fix that. Secondly, I'm comfortable when it's individual patients. I'm less comfortable when you cross the line and make inheritable edits the way the Chinese doctor did two years ago. And we start editing in a way in embryos or reproductive cells that'll be inherited by all of the descendants of a person. Even so, if the, the, the I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but just even if the, uh, uh, the condition that you have corrected for is heritable, you would not. Well, no, if you have an inheritable condition, let us say sickle cell, that can be fixed as it has been this past year by taking out your stem cells of your blood, editing them, putting them back in, and then you're cured. I've oversimplified a bit. But what you could also do is edit the reproductive cells in your body, your eggs, your sperm, or early stage embryos, so that none of your children will ever have it and none of their descendants will ever have it. And that's a step further. Uh, there's a wonderful kid in the book, you may remember, named David Sanchez, 17 years old. He loves playing basketball, except for when he doubles over in pain because he's got sickle cell. He's been treated for it. And they tell him now with CRISPR, we can make sure your children will never have it. And he said, that's great. And then he pauses and he said, but maybe we should wait and let the kid decide. And they say, well, why would you want your kid to have sickle cell? He says, well, I wouldn't, but I know it's taught me empathy. It's taught me persistence. It's taught me, it's molded my character. So maybe we shouldn't do it to future generations. We should let the kids decide themselves. Now he's only 17, but he's one of the best bioethicists in my book. So these are the things, there's no answers. I'm, I'm gonna spoil it for people who have the book. There's no answers in the last chapter. We're gonna have to go hand in hand and think these things through. And there is no one uh, making rules much less with enforcement power. And the surprising thing that you learn is how, how easy this is. 
-hmm. and how available the, how do I call it? The technology is going to be, you can kind of like a 3D printer, you can get this stuff online in the near future. You can get it now online. You can get CRISPR editing uh, agents online, uh, some from biohackers, some from regular companies. And use it to fit, you know, make frogs or, or that are stronger or whatever you want to do. Uh, the problem is it's a little hard to deliver it in the human cells. But I went into Jennifer Doudna's lab and within two days it edited human cells. Now we mix it with chlorine and pushed it down the drain. So it's not a bit unleashed. But yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to regulate a technology that's not like building atom bombs, which it's hard to do in your basement. People can do this. But I do think the Chinese put that doctor in jail who edited the early stage embryos. And the Chinese are actually working very closely. Jennifer Doudna in this book is, is one of the leaders of bringing people from different countries together saying, we're all gonna have to have rules of the road. So now Francis Collins in the US, they do not, the National Institutes of Health allow inheritable gene edit. The Chinese have now banned it, whatever. But they are allowing research so we can actually fix diseases. And I think that Jennifer Downfield and I feel this technology is 80, 90 percent wonderful and good. We have to stop it from being overused and used in ways that might be frightening. But let's not stop this technology. We got a lot of viruses we need to fight. We got a lot of cancers we need to fight. We got a lot of little 12 year olds who have congenital conditions who want to lead a normal life. So let's not be afraid of this science. This is, this, is, this is transformative and transformative mainly for good. Yeah, this is, the last year has been an opportunity for us to be reminded, uh, as some more persuaded than others, to listen to the science. <laughs> uh, that The science has produced the, the vaccine that's going to end this uh, pandemic, uh, at least this one, and maybe help us be uh, less uh, vulnerable to uh, the next, uh, but you know, science can also be scary. If you grew up with James Bond movies, there was always a bad guy that had an army of of, of people who were you know doing very bad things. And in in this case, the science, uh, uh, a, a a reasonably knowledgeable grad student with ill intent um, uh, could mess around, or a very wealthy person. Uh, could have opportunities uh, and buy uh, the gene uh, enhancing uh, opportunities that, well, there are a lot of questions and uh, uh, to be raised. And I think I'd like to turn it over to uh, your participants and see if there are uh, questions from them. I will be happy to pursue it all by myself. I'm opening up. Um, and while we'll wait, let me just mention that you're yeah. right. When Jennifer Dowden had discovered this technology with Emmanuel Sharpenjay and engineered it to be keen editing, she had a nightmare. And the nightmare was somebody wanted to meet her to understand this technology. She went into the room and it was Hitler. And that's when she starts this process of international control. But she also has been working very hard, she and other scientists uh, as part of her labs, uh, to create what's called anti-CRISPR because uh, we need to be able to reverse this or stop this if a malevolent actor uses it. Anti-CRISPR is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a way to reverse uh, some CRISPR uh, process. So instead of being afraid of the science, I think it's important for us to march hand in glove and sort of understand what's happening because it's like, whether it's vaccines or GMOs or climate change, people distrust the scientists. I think that's a bad thing. I think we ought to use that scientific method to say, let me look at the facts and then revise my theories. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, some of the, 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 the good things that, that uh, you could do, the diseases that you just enumerated, um, what do those uh, opportunities have in common? Uh, uh, sickle cell you have, have, have mentioned uh, there are limits to what the technology, the CRISPR technology now could do. Uh, there are many diseases that have multiple um, uh, uh, genetic components. 
uh, that that couldn't with um, a single splice cut and paste be eliminated. Uh, you know, how, how vast is the opportunity to cure disease in general? Are we still kind of, it, 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 it baby steps in what we can address or not? Right, address? we're still at the first step. And as I say, you understand this a lot better than you're pretending to be because you've read the book. And it's so easy to at least begin with, with these single gene mutations, meaning sickle cell, Huntington's, uh, cystic fibrosis, many of those are just simple mistakes in the gene and correcting them. We know we're not going to get into a huge problem because if you change it, you change it back to the way the species is typical. In other words, the way most people have it. And so those are relatively easy, but it's a good time to start thinking about when we can do more complicated ones. And you could march down the list. Certainly relatively easy, but a bit more complicated is muscle mass myostatin and other things in our body regulate how much muscle mass we have or our kids have. And you can easily take a CRISPR and probably increase the muscle mass. We've done it for cows. We've you know, done it for other animals, mice with double muscling. And I think athletic directors and pushy parents will at some point be interested in saying, let me increase the muscle mass. Let me increase height. Hair color and eye color, probably pretty simple but you can keep marching down the spectrum where it gets more and more complicated. Memory is moderately simple, but if you get to real intelligence and processing power, that's a complex mix of genes. We have decades before we're ever gonna figure out. And then you get to psychological issues, uh, just people's personalities, or for that matter, you know, their uh, mental outlook, uh, whether they're uh, manic depressive, schizophrenic, whatever, there's some genetic component to it. There's many other components we don't understand. Dyslexia, uh, another one. So I think those are the ones we don't need to go near for another few decades so we fully understand. But we should take those few decades to say, what would we do if we could fix this? Yes. Well, as someone who has, and I was 50 years old when I was switched and uh, I wasn't uh, bipolar when I was 49, but when I was 50, I was, and I have been. Um, and you wrote a great book about it. And as you know, and maybe you can explain it more, there, nobody quite fully understands the causes, but I suspect there are both genetic causes and environmental causes and just random Things, right? Yes, I have been told by uh, uh, by friends at uh, the uh, McGovern at uh, MIT that um, uh, you know bipolar is very complicated and probably when it is understood will like cancer be multiple multiple uh, different kinds of, of 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 disorders not with you know one uh, one gene component so it's a it's a devil but um, it it. It's in the same neighborhood as Parkinson's. So whenever they make progress in Parkinson's, I celebrate uh, because I think we might be a, a, we're at least in the neighborhood of, of understanding a disease with behavioral symptoms where Parkinson's is a disease with uh, um, uh, uh, mechanical and, and uh, physical uh, symptoms more, more likely, but they literally are the same uh, part of, of the brain. But when you talk about eye color and hair, it seems so, so insignificant, uh, so puny. And yet in the abstract, that's a powerful thing uh, to discuss because you're talking about the ability that some might have to gain advantage in a world that already favors the advantage unfairly. And um, describe, if you will, how CRISPR could be used to, um, to give uh, the, 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 the wealthy, uh, the powerful, favored, uh, a permanent encoded human advantage uh, to create a, 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 a separate, you know, race of people, if you will. Uh, imagine that for us. 
Yeah, it's like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World or the movie Gattaca or whatever. We've always worried about that ability. And yes, if we leave it to just individuals, I mean, there are two ways to look at this. Should society have rules? Or like many reproductive rights issues, we leave it to the individuals in the family. You know, I tend to think we should let individuals have as much power as they can. But if we leave it to individuals, there's a couple of worries. And the main one is the one you cited, which is if you could just go to the genetic supermarket and order up traits, you know, some might be trivial, like hair color and eye color. Some might give you some real competitive advantage, like adding eight inches to your height, making yourself, making your kids more muscular. Uh, some might truly give advantages in terms of like enhancing memory, but, you know, gets into dangerous areas. But if these offerings at the genetic supermarket aren't going to be free, and they won't be, what happens? Does that mean the rich get to buy better genes for their kids? We already have inequality, but this would kick it, not only kick it up a notch, but a whole new quantum orbit, because it would be encoded into our species. We'd almost have a subspecies of genetically enhanced kids. So this is why I don't think it should just be left to the individual marketplace. People worry when they think of gene editing about state eugenics, you know, the, the Nazis, whatever, trying to create a master race. I don't think that's going to happen. But what could happen a few decades from now is just a free market eugenics where individuals who can afford it create genetic advantages for their children. So that's, I think, number one, we have to guard against. And if I may say the other, because it's related, you know, behind me, you, you look at those nice windows. I like them. They open up to a balcony on Royal Street here in the French Quarter of New Orleans. And uh, as you may note from my book, I started this journey sitting on that balcony. And what particularly worried me was it was a weekend that all sorts of things were happening in New Orleans. There was the gay pride parades and a block party right below us. There was a Leah Chase, a, a Creole of color, wonderful woman who owned a great restaurant, had died in her 90s. There were second line parades for her. There was uh, the Creole Tomato Festival, so celebrating non-GMO tomatoes. There was a naked bicycle ride to celebrate uh, traffic safety, believe it or not. I don't know how those two connected. Uh, and I'm looking on my balcony at the diversity of people below me, short and tall, fat and skinny, gay and straight and trans, and, you know, skin colors of various hues and hair colors and all these things. And people from Gallaudet University, you know, sign languaging each other. And I realized that this offers us the possibility to choose those traits. Do we want our children to be hearing enabled or not to be deaf? Do we want them to be taller? Do we want them, well, name, name whatever trait you want. And if we start doing that, do we edit some of the diversity out of our species? That's another problem. That said, these two problems, I really think the biggest problem is people get all you know, scared of this whole thing. And then we don't fight cancer. And then we let kids have genetic diseases. Uh, then we, uh, you know, people are suffering and we're not pushing the bounds of science. So I think we have to, you know, people felt that way about IVF, you know, test two babies. They felt that way about a lot of things. Um, I, I just think we have to keep an open mind and then try to approach it from a moral standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you mentioned a name earlier that I, I, I wanted to return to, not because uh, I, I want to get to the, the chapter, the reason a George Church is in your book is not what I want to talk about. You yeah. read the book and find out why George Church, but he was uh, an important uh, player in, uh, in DNA, in, in that research. But you just mentioned uh, it, you know, in, in the book that George Church was the kind of scientist who he, he, he needed to visualize things. If he could uh, visualize it, um, I guess I, I, I imagine uh, seeing the, uh, the, 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 the structure of a building. If, if I could visualize it, then I could figure out how that building 
works. Well, he could visualize something, then he could figure out how it works. And as a scientist, he's visualizing things I cannot even imagine. Uh, but he's dyslexic. His dyslexia demanded uh, that he visual, that's how he could, that's how he could learn. Without this visual ability, visualization, he couldn't have been the creative scientist that he was. I mean, to, uh, to imagine the, 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 the famous double helix that we all can visualize now was pretty important in understanding how it worked. Well, Imagine you're a parent and you say, well, we'll want to correct for that dyslexia. Now you have taken someone's scientific gift of insight. You've taken it away. Uh, you know, so that is such an interesting question. And I must say, you provoked me to think more than I did in the book. Because, yes, George Church is dyslexic. He visualizes things and said that's how he processes information. By the way, Einstein was very slow in learning how to talk, had trouble reading, and he visualizes things. He visualizes what is the force field hitting that compass needle? What would I look like if I rode alongside a light beam? So he visualizes things. That's where he gets it. Jennifer Dowda does things very visual. She realizes that visualizing the structure of RNA will tell you what it can do. And as you say, dyslexia which we consider a disability. And maybe we would edit it out if we had the gene tools to do so. Maybe dyslexia is not just a disability or even mainly a disability. It is a trait people have that causes somebody like a George Church to be, or an Einstein, to be a great visualizer. So that's another caution and you were really smart to put your finger on this because I don't really discuss this in the book, but it's true. When you look at George Church, you can say to yourself, hey, what if his parents had said, I will edit out this dyslexia? George Church would have been a much happier kid, but he may not have been the person who's been at the forefront of this revolution. And likewise, one of the characters in my book is James Watson. And as you know, he's caused some real problems recently, but he has a schizophrenic son. And part of it is he looks at everything through a genetic lens because of his schizophrenic son. And his son, who's in the book, is actually a very wise person, wiser than his father in many ways, but it's some of the same traits that, that you know, this trait that they have in their personality that causes, I think, Watson to be a really good scientist, but really cross the moral lines. So human nature is complicated. We don't want to mess with that until we figure out how it works. We've got a question um, uh, from Nicole Lum. Thank you, Nicole, uh, who, who asks, Walter, can this genetic manipulation currently be applied to lengthening lifespan? Well, you know about telomeres, of course, by asking that question, I suspect. And yes, there's a lot of work going on about how, because that's simply a very simple genetic thing. And a telomere, you know, the longer it is, longer, and it shortens as you go along. So can you tweak that in ways that allow you to live longer? There are people working on that. That would not be my first priority if I were a scientist. I don't think it's something that's doable in the next decade, but I think there are similar things besides, you know, approach on telomeres in which aging uh, researchers, people who research aging, are going to be able to do a lot of things that will be far more useful, such as understanding the genetic components of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia understanding uh, blood and brain uh, functions and how to make our lives not necessarily just longer, but better. And so I hope they'll focus on uh, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, things that might hurt our um, heart and other things so that we can lead healthier lives rather than just pursue 
some of these tech billionaire dreams of trying to live for another hundred years? You know, um, uh, b- before I uh, had my um, a revelation uh, it, 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 at the age of 50, uh, I wasn't afraid of it uh, because the 90s had been designated, I guess, by uh, the first President Bush, the decade of the brain. So I actually recognized uh, you know, that, that it wasn't about demons, which sometimes our colleagues in journalism still write about you know, demons, uh, but the decade of the brain uh, and then the, 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 the technology uh, revolution. Do you see, uh, I mean, you've got Jennifer Doudna, uh, uh, Fang Zhang, uh, who were uh, ahead of their time. Uh, both of them would be in their 50s, correct? Well, Fang Zhang is younger. Uh, Jennifer younger. Is in the 50s. Okay, well, of course he is. He's Mark Zuckerberg's age, idiot. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? They'll be 50 someday. Okay. But he'll be 50 sooner or later. So, but now do you see uh, the young people moving into the life sciences, uh, uh, pursuing careers uh, instead of, of chasing uh, this, uh, you know, careers in, 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 in tech uh, or, is tech well tell me well when i was uh, first covering tech as a young reporter i remember in the 80s and 90s the west coast computer fairs and all the comdexes and all these wonderful conferences and suddenly the nerds in our class had become the cool kids on the block and the steve jobs is with the heroes and you know the cool kids now when i go around to the CRISPR and other conferences i realize that bio is the new tech Uh, They're the cool kids. There's amazing young people who are going into it. And I think CRISPR, as well as coronavirus, has spurred that. Just this past 12 months, the uh, people applying to medical school or to do uh, life science research has increased 18%. And uh, 60% of the people doing biology and biology research in colleges and universities are women. So it's a much more open field. And I think, yes, now it's becoming just like I did. And, you know, a lot of my friends did, we had to learn to code when we were young. And then we kind of pushed our kids to learn JavaScript and C++ and other coding. I think the people who know digital coding are going to be joined uh, by kids who know genetic coding, who code not with zeros and ones, with the four letters of DNA or of RNA. So, and I also think there'll be a combination. There's some really cool people, Cameron Mirvold, who's the son of a friend of mine, Nathan Mirvold, who had worked for Microsoft. He's specialized in computational biology and computer science and also genetics. And he's combining the computer revolution uh, with the genetic revolution. And President Biden's chief science advisor, a big part of my book, one of the main characters, but he's a mathematician who became a computational biologist who became a geneticist, and now he's going to be chief uh, science advisor to the president. So yes, I think the days of digital coding are about to be, uh, you know, joined and maybe even surpassed by people who understand the code of life. What are you doing next? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to take a few months off and Kathy and I are going to travel again. We just came up to Washington. I'm happy to say. And next time I come, I'm going to go to politics and prose. Uh, and, but I'm interested in people who have really thrown themselves both into human society and also everything from technology to science and then tried to apply it for good. I mean, Bill Gates obviously fascinates me. Uh, but you know, there are other people maybe go back in the way back machine this time and find a historical character, but I always want to find people who are very creative and, um, imaginative. And, uh, as I said, at the very beginning of this Jane, you and I have led charmed lives. We were able to enter a profession and be part of a field in which we got to earn a living 
by being curious, by asking questions and by talking to smart people. And uh, I still hope I've got a lot more of that in me. But, you know, this Jennifer Doudna and the people who created gene editing, I'm still so engrossed in this topic uh, that uh, I'm going to think about that for a while longer before I move on. Well, you are a historian. You uh, are a professor of history, among all those other things. And as they say, history will decide. Um, you can see only so far into the future. Uh, we will, uh, we will, another generation will perhaps uh, decide what, uh, where CRISPR took us. And I, I hope it's to very, very good places for the people who are living to be 150. <laughs> It's not my generation. Uh, Walter, um, uh, talking to you is always great and uh, congratulate you on uh, the code breaker and its impending success. I'm fascinated by you're like a, a, a double helix strand yourself. You love the past, but you are you know, wedded to the, the future and you combine them in such interesting ways. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jane. It was a real honor to be uh, interviewed by you. I mean, somebody who's just done so much. And also, I want to keep in mind that it's not people like me that do it. It's people like Jennifer Doudna, George Church, Fong Jang, the people in the book. You know, we often think that heroes wear capes. Sometimes they wear lab coats, and we learned that in the coronavirus thing. So this book is mainly about, is about them. And I'm just lucky to be an observer, and they allowed me to take notes. Yes. Well, I hope people who are reading your book are fascinated, go into careers and, and make humanity the better for it. Turning it uh, back over to uh, Brad Graham uh, from Prose and Politics. Hello, Brad. Hey, Jane. Great, great moderating. And, you know, for a 20th, 20th century person, you clearly <laughs> still know what questions to ask about 21st century yeah. issues. Uh, and Walter? man of all ages. Uh, you've done it again. I, I, I really hope many people do read your fascinating book and, and then can think more informatively about the implications of this, this powerful uh, technology of gene, gene editing. Um, here's the cover, Code Breakers. Uh, a reminder that in the chat column, you can find a link to purchase uh, the Code Breaker. Uh, to all of you watching, uh, thanks again for tuning in. And from all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. Thank you.